Um, so the webinar is being recorded. It'll be available on our forestry um, website. So, um, and we have a YouTube channel. So if you never want to miss a recording from um, USU Forestry, I recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel. Um, as soon as Einer gets started, I will grab the link and put it in our um, chat window down here um, at the corner so you can click subscribe and stay updated. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, if you're interested in um, looking at the Oak document and sort of following along, um, I put the link to that in the chat window as well, so you can grab that um, and have it open. And there's also a link to CEUs. Uh, there are two Society of American Forestry CEUs available to folks that stay um, on the webinar for the entire um, time. So I think, I think that's it. Um, I don't see Gloria up on the screen, but I'm going to have Einar um, let's see, maybe I'll wait for, for Gloria to, to pop up. Can you give me the thumbs up if you're, you're good to go? Okay, all right. Um, next up we have Einer Jensen. He's a community risk re reduction specialist uh, with the South Metro Fire and Rescue. Um, he is all loaded and ready to get going. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and hand it over to Einer. Okay, just making sure everybody can hear me out there in Utah land. She's got thumbs up. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, so uh, now for something completely different. Well, not completely different because we're still talking about oak, but we're talking about a different way of treating oak. We're talking about goats, like our little guys on the rocks here. So, oh, see, there's the... Uh, no, I think you're good. Just click on the screen and that might have to sort of activate it and then use your arrow. Oh, yeah. There you go. Brilliant. Had to wake okay. up. So uh, forgive me, but I'm gonna go through some more Gamble Oak facts, but uh, today is all about oak, so... Uh, uh, we can all suck it up. So uh, it is a native, and there was a question earlier from someone about whether oak was a, a native species or an invasive species. It's a native, just like us. Uh, 4,500, 9,000 feet of elevation. And its vegetative reproduction, as we all know, is from sprouts uh, through its lignotuber and rhizome systems. And uh, disturbances are what's going to cause it to, uh, to crank up. Now, what I've found amusing listening to the other presentations is that we seem, as, as uh, subject matter experts, we seem surprised that oak would recover so rapidly from top kill, but that's what oak does. Um, so whether it's fire or mastication or anything else that just treats the top of the oak and wipes out the top of the oak, just like when we humans are disturbed, it comes back with a vengeance. And, and, and so we do know that. We know that anything that wipes out the top of the oak generates massively thick, dense stands. So, uh, that was okay. I, I almost got ahead of myself. That's awkward. So the way that the oak works, and we know this, is that the, it uses its carbohydrate reserves to grow leaves. Uh, and that's important because uh, it needs to, it, it, it relies on the photosynthesis to generate new carbs after those leaves mature. So in the spring, the oak uses all of its carb reserves to uh, produce those leaves and then it's empty, it's drained. It's gotta take the, the rest of the summer then to generate new leaves, or excuse me, to generate new carbohydrates so that it can survive the winter. But what that means is that if the shrubs are defoliated when the carb reserves are lowest, then that individual shrub has to draw on its already critically low reserves to produce no, new photosynthetic tissue. Uh, it, and this is all coming together in my mind as to why current methods of, uh, of treating the oak just aren't working. So if the plant is growing leaves, it's not growing roots, it's not growing sprouts. And as it turns out, oak has this chemical in its leaves called gallotannin. It's a combination of gallic and tannic acid that then changes the soil chemistry so that the soil chemistry is good habitat for oak, but it's not good habitat for anything else. And again, that shouldn't surprise us. That with the other presentations, we're talking about uh, the surprise that that uh, after the oak came back, nothing else was growing there. No forbs, no grass. It was hard for the pondos to come back in. It's because the oak changes the soil chemistry that those other species aren't able to grow there. It's all part of the oak survival technique. It's kind of like us humans when we go with pavements, I guess. So gamble oak burns most readily between October 1st and snowfall, at least in my district. In my district, I'm in the, the southern metropolitan area of Denver, 
wedged in between the city and county of Denver and the city of Castle Rock. And our territory stretches from uh, just about the hogback, so that first little hill of the front range out east. And for a lot of that territory, we do have oak there. Uh, Gamble Oak also burns well during the dry summer conditions, uh, especially where the, the summer becomes hottest and driest, which is on the south aspects and on steeper slopes. Uh, and we've been having issues with late spring freezes recently, so we get additional kill in the oak, additional dry, dead tinder uh, that lasts throughout the summer and the early fall. Now, instead of using mastication, which, uh, which homeowners associations in our area have shown really aren't that effective, instead of using prescribed fire, which we'd like to use more of, but based on the previous research I heard today, isn't gonna help either, we've been using goats. And I would definitely encourage all of you listening in uh, goat, or excuse me, in oak ecosystems that this might be an area, a, a technique for you to consider. Goats are effective against oak, against gamble oak, uh, for these reasons in part. Their narrow muzzle uh, is able to, so they can get into the oak. Sorry, I talk with my hands a lot. Uh, they, they're able to get after the, the leaves, the shoots, the, the bark stripping. Uh, inside the, the thick uh, the, the thickets of, of oak. They have long legs, so they can actually stand up on their hind legs and reach up into the crowns or the canopy of the oak, which allows them to get up about six feet tall in terms of defoliating that oak. So they're, what they're doing is they're removing those ladder fuels for us. And because of their, their stomachs, their, the, the enzymes in their bellies, they can wipe out the toxicity of leaves that prevent other browsers from eating oak leaves. Uh, we have plenty of deer and, and elk in our uh, ecosystem here with South Metro Fire Rescue, but they don't like eating oak leaves. Goats do. Now, how productive, how useful is a goat? Uh, a goat can eat, and these are, I believe they're cashmere goats, if I remember correctly. One of these goats will eat 3% of its body weight in dry mass each day, so each 24 hour period. And that means if we've got a 100 pound goat, it could eat three pounds of dry mass. But what they're eating is usually full of water because it's still growing on the trees. And so what they're actually eating is closer to 30 pounds of green vegetation on the oak. And that's, that makes a significant difference. At least visually, it makes a significant difference. And so I had a lot of people ask me, why goats? Well, especially as opposed to other more traditional uh, techniques for working on oak. Uh, it's because of the ladder fuels, because these goats, as this little guy in the picture here shows us, maybe a big guy, uh, they're able to wipe out those ladder fuels far more easily than any hand crew could. Again, defoliating from the surface all the way up to about six feet above the ground as far as their, uh, their legs can carry them up into the, the canopy. They're also good with weed reduction. So as they eat things like uh, Canada thistle, the enzymes in their bellies wipe out the seeds so that the seeds are unable to germinate once they come back out as feces. Uh, and those feces, as well as their urine, it's actually fertilizing the soil. It's uh, with their hooves, they're able to grind the, the feces and the urine back into the soil and improve that soil in ways that uh, tracked vehicles and wheeled vehicles just don't. And by eating the leaves, they're not encouraging the growth of the thickets. They're not encouraging the, the oak to come back with a vengeance. What they're doing is they're using the oak's ability against itself. So by eating those leaves, the oak is then spending its carb reserves that are already critically low to produce new leaves instead of spreading out with its sprouts, with its root system, that sort of thing. So does it work? Here's a way to look whether it uh, works visually. So here's the, the pre-eating, and here's pretty much the same view after a half day of uh, goats eating the oak. So you can see what they're doing. They're eliminating the surface fuels, they're eliminating the, the grasses as well, the little bit of the, the forbs on the ground, but you can see they're treating the, the ladder fuels. And it, it turns out this summer, we saw them eating some of the low hanging branches off of the ponderosas as well. Uh, and this is in the Pine Ridge ecosystem in, uh, or the Pine Ridge open space in the city of Castle Pines. But just visually, it seems to be working. Now, the previous picture shows us what happens during that year of treatment, during that summer of treatment. 
And this is, uh, they're, we're treating the oak here in uh, late May and in June, a little bit of July. But this year, before the goats were released back in this one acre uh, of uh, treatment area, this is how the oak had greened up from the, the spring. Uh, and it greened up without its ladder fuels there. So to me, this, this is the proof in the pudding. This is, this is oak that had been treated in the Pine Ridge open space for four seasons. And so when the oak was greening up after the winter dormant period, it was greening up without having those ladder fuels already in position. So it almost seems like the oak is uh, on a little micro evolution to, uh, to change how it's growing. And isn't that what we're after? Uh, the, the research that we've already looked into shows that goat treatment for three to five years straight can help produce uh, a system like this and then, uh, or a, uh, a grow back like this, and then using goats again in a five year period. So once every five years will help maintain oak stands like this. So uh, we got a little bit of uh, educational use out of this as well. Uh, between 2015 and 2018, we've been promoting the heck out of uh, using goats. We, uh, we received a grant from the Ready, Set, Go group uh, back in 2016, I believe, and we rebranded this as Ready, Set, Goat. Uh, and I say we because it's not just South Metro Fire Rescue. We were smart enough to tie our wagon to this project that actually started with the Pine Ridge Homeowners Association in the city of Castle Pines. And that grew last year, or this year, I should say, 2018, to include the estates of Buffalo Ridge, the Retreat, Glen Oaks, and Daniels Ridge. Again, all neighborhoods within the city of Castle Pines. Other partners include the city itself, Douglas County Libraries, uh, which has helped us with uh, getting kids involved in terms of being interested in goats specifically, but also wildfires and mitigation. FEMA, the Colorado State Forest Service, Douglas County, uh, Allstate Insurance, Ridge Golf Course, they have all helped us out as well. And really, because we keep doing an open house every summer in Pine Ridge, it turns out the residents are helping us. They're, they're helping us sell the idea that, that mitigation can work. It's not about putting machines in the garden, which in a lot of ways can turn people off of mitigation. It's, it's about using more ecologically friendly ways to get similar results. Now, ultimately, we won't know if, if this mitigation is truly working until we get a fire down there. And frankly, that's not something I want in my fire district. But it seems to be working to this point. So, uh, and that's, you can say that, okay, it's, it's working because it looks like it. But it turns out we need more, we need something better, more robust to tell us whether this is working ecologically. So a couple of years ago, I reached out to the students, the uh, AP environmental science kids and the biology, uh, advanced placement biology kids and their teachers at one of the high schools in our fire district, uh, neighboring fire district, I should say, Rock Canyon High School. And their teachers felt that this would be, that studying the short-term and long-term impact of goats would be a great way to get their kids some field experience. And so th these pictures here show these kids gathering data before and after goat treatment to see what those, what the short-term and long-term effects of goats would be on the ecosystem. And so they're, they're doing real basic things along a transect with these quadrats. They're, they're looking for the variety of species or diversity of species. They're looking at the number of species, both of flora and fauna. They're measuring uh, diameter, breast height. They're, they're uh, me measuring uh, how much, uh, how high in the canopy the oak, the uh, excuse me, the goats are browsing. All the and they're also measuring uh, soil quality. I should say as well that uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels inside the soil, soil moisture content, soil temperature. Again, before goats and in uh, every month after the goats treat a given area. Uh, I don't remember my next slide. So, and then they haven't just been sitting on this; they've been sharing this research as well through uh, their connections with Colorado State University. And they've, it turns out that crowdsourcing, especially with kids, crowdsourcing this research uh, benefits more than just the fire department. So uh, this is uh, Delaney on the left with, long, with the uh, blonde hair and Lauren on the right with the dark hair. Uh, they took this research and it turned, this is a little plug for them, 
they have been competing in the regional and state science fairs, and they've done so well that uh, next spring they're going to be at the uh, in Washington D.C. at the Junior Academy of Science uh, exhibition, that sort of thing. And again, what are they talking about? They're talking about goats, and they're talking about mitigation, and they're talking about wildfire. And if we want to get the next generation of residents of the wildland urban interface interested in those sorts of topics, this is a great way to do it. Uh, and this is their uh, article, Analyzing Goat Browsing as a Form of Wildfire Mitigation and Its Environmental Impacts. And again, they uh, published this uh, in part with uh, Colorado State University, I believe. So uh, good stuff, good stuff. So uh, ultimately, are you ready for popular mitigation? You can tell I'm a words guy. We had a neighborhood a few years ago. We, uh, we helped them find a grant from FEMA and the Coalition for the Upper South Platte to do mastication in their open space. And they, the residents opposed, vehemently opposed putting the machine in the garden. And as the research has shown today and in the Gamble Oak, uh, the report there, mastication isn't the long-term solution. It's also not popular. But this, I would argue, is a better, more ecologically sane uh, mitigation solution for our neighborhoods You'll get your population on board. They'll, they'll be excited about these goats uh, and about mitigation and talking about wildfire. And in terms of getting the job done, for me as a wildfire mitigation specialist for South Metro Fire Rescue, my role as a risk reduction specialist, these goats are making my job a whole lot simpler. So uh, there's my contact information. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, there's my email address. That's my Twitter handle. And uh, I'll be watching for the next several, uh, well, until the end of the uh, webinar here. So if you have more questions, uh, please pop them in and I'll answer them as well as I can. Great, Einer. One quick question that came in. Yeah. Um, do you know if goats will eat kudzu? Oh, gosh. I, I don't know if goats will eat kudzu or not. Uh, it would be great if they could. Maybe somebody, um, you know, somebody might know. We have 121 people watching, so maybe somebody out there might know. But I'm so getting some nods from our in-person audience here. Uh, what's your name again? Jen. Jen and Greg. Uh, and Jen, you're with with CSU. CSU, lots of cool plant and uh, forestry stuff. And Greg is... Grad school in Georgia, and both of these folks say goats will, in fact, eat kudzu. All right, and we have Connor from North Carolina um, said they yes, they, they use them for kudzu management. Fantastic. Yeah, so cool. That said, keep your kudzu out of my state. Um, Russell has a question for Einer. I'm going to have you stop sharing so folks can, so um, Gloria can get um, yeah. Claire, Claire's um, talk right, loaded. So go ahead and uh, stop sharing, and then I'll read you the question from Russell. Wait what a minute. How do I stop sharing? Oh, there it is. It says, yes. oh, durr. Okay. You got it. All right. Um, Russell asks, what are the costs compared to traditional treatment mechanical um, when compared with goat, goat management? So the company we use uh, is called Goat Green, and it's out of uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And they charge $1,000 per day for a herd of 300 goats. There's additional uh, mileage and startup fees uh, associated with that. But it, the best rate that we found for a masticator on a single day is about $1,200 a day. So $1,000 $1, so, per 300 goats. Right. Now, a masticator can do all that work in one day. Goats will take longer. But in terms of uh, getting the, the neighborhood in support of what you're doing, uh, it, masticators we alienate people goats we bring people in to be more uh excited about mitigation um greg awesome. greg hilbig um mentioned um that draper city here in, in utah um draper city trails and open space uses goats for phragmites and myrtle spurge control so we have cities in colorado that use uh, goats for noxious weeds in their open space as well westminster does that um, is there a reason why cashmere goats were used as opposed to another breed, do you know? That is a great question that I'd have to do research on. I think it's just that the the firm up in Cheyenne uses cashmere goats. It could be the way they evolved. I don't know, but it, email me and I'll see if I can get a better answer for you. 
great. And that, that leads me to a good point. Um, we have a bunch of people registered. Um, and so I will send out an email um, to everybody that registered today with the contact information of all of our speakers, with the link to um, where this recording will be hosted so folks can easily access that information. Um, somebody asked, how many acres are you actually able to treat using goats versus mechanical treatments? Given the extents of will we, how will we get ahead of this problem? Wait, so, I'm sorry, I was looking at it. That's okay. It. You better say that again. So no worries. I'm sorry. So how well, many acres, how many acres are you actually able to treat oh. using this method with goats uh, versus mechanical treatments? And given the extent of the wildland urban interface, um, any thoughts on how to get ahead of this problem? So uh, the, the herd of 300 goats can treat about an acre a day, eliminating all surface fuels and uh, the, the ladder fuels up to about six feet tall. Uh, so it takes a while, given that each open space area, it's about uh, six acres of open space that they're treating. So uh, it, it takes six or seven days. And then one of the HOAs actually wanted to treat it twice in one season. So they came in for another six days. Uh, and again, a masticator can do it a lot more rapidly. But if we're looking at long-term impact or long-term success of mitigation, so far we're having better success with goats than we did with masticators. Great. All right, I'm gonna leave it there and have Gloria start sharing the screen for um, Claire to get started. Thank you so much, Einar. There's a, um, I'm sure that more questions will come in at the end and we'll address them as they come in. Good deal. All right, you're almost there, Gloria. And make sure you unmute yourself so we can hear you. That's a good deal. Okay, check, check. Everybody here? Everybody's good to go. Okay, do you need presenter view? With notes or anything? Um, presenter view would be good. All right, let's see. I think we're, are we in presenter view? Hold on, folks. Sorry. I don't really need it. You don't, you don't have notes? I don't need it. Okay. It's slideshow from beginning. We should be ready to go. Looks great. Okay. Let me get this out of your way a little bit. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Okay, folks, here's Claire Volk um, with um, Corteva AgriScience, and I believe you're part of uh, Dow AgriSciences, and she'll be talking to us about uh, a little bit about Garlon. And I really wanted Claire here because my husband and I used to run a wildfire mitigation business and had to rely heavily on Garlon for um, uh, Gamble Oak mitigation up in the mountains. Um, and it presents, it can present a lot of management issues. It, it has, well, I didn't quite say that right. It, it's um, another consideration that takes some careful management and application to use effectively. And as, as I understand, um, agro, Dow AgriSciences is always working with the formula to make it more effective. And um, so I really wanted to have her here to talk about this management. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Gloria. Um, my name is Claire Volk. I am a territory manager for Corteva AgriScience. I deal with pasture and land management in Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. I am by no means an expert on Gamble Oak, but I get more and more calls and more and more instances where this is becoming problematic in my territory. So some of the information is from my own personal experience, but I've also relied heavily on our field scientists as well as our forestry specialists in the Pacific Northwest in this challenging oak species. So kind of a roadmap and also the theme for really this presentation on utilizing herbicides as a tool in managing Gamble Oak is having a roadmap and having a plan. So today I'm going to walk through uh, from beginning to end some things and considerations that you as either a land manager, um, a land owner, owner, or someone who is building a plan around managing Gamble Oak. Um, some things that you're going to need to really think about before and after making that application from equipment to calibration. And also, I hope that I can manage your all's expectations in terms of what to expect. Like I said, herbicide is just one tool in the toolbox. And if you utilize some of these herbicide recipes, if, as if you will, um, effectively, you could also in a, integrate some other management tools like grazing. 
Um, so want to kind of talk to you about how to utilize that uh, program approach and then also leave some time for questions. So because this species has a very interconnected root system, that's one of the main challenges in getting a herbicide program to work. Um, so the, one of the first questions I ask when I get this call is what is the size or acreage of infestation and what is the history of manipulation to this species? And when I say manipulation, I mean, has anything ever grazed it? Has anyone ever cut it? Have you ever done a treatment here before? Um, knowing all of that is going to be very important as we're building a recommendation on how to move forward. Also stand density. Do you see a couple gamble oaks scattered or do we pretty much have a monoculture over here? This is going to be really important when we dial in our herbicide recommendations to make sure that you're staying on label. Um, also, do you already have any existing desirable species? Like the previous presentation uh, had mentioned, sometimes when you get a monoculture in there, we're really just concerned with the gamble oak, but I will say that some of the herbicides that we're going to talk about can impact those species. Most of the time we can get those species to bounce back within a year or two years or integrate some type of reseeding, but having an idea of what you are looking to do and what you're willing to do will help us uh, build that, like I said, build that recommendation. Your tools and equipment are going to be very, very closely tied to how much money you are willing to invest and to spend. This is one that if you haven't gotten to this step yet, I don't recommend you call me because we can talk about a very, very expensive but very efficacious method, um, but you have to be willing to put in the time and make that investment in order for it to work. Um, and again, we do not have a silver bullet out here, and this is going to take not only potential repeated herbicide applications, but also utilizing other tools in the toolbox. This is not a spray and walk away kind of, kind of program. Um, so, combining all of these in together, as we kind of think about where we want to go with Gamble Oak and what our plan is moving forward, one of the first things we need to think about is if herbicide is a tool that we're willing to use, what our timing is going to look like. I am going to talk about uh, foliar treatments, cut stump treatments, which in our experience has been the most efficacious method. Um, and then also a broadcast treatment. And this is kind of a schedule that shows you when you could or couldn't. The nice thing with cut stump is you can make that treatment year round. It is very labor intensive or can be very labor intensive, but you have the highest chances of success and you've got a lot of time to do it. Foliar could potentially be the most tricky application uh, to get in the window of opportunity we do have a fairly wide window. If the tree is just starting to put on leaves, and this is true with the majority of our foliar applications, if that tree is still putting on leaves, we do not wanna make that application. You want the absolute most foliar um, surface available for that plant to take up that herbicide. Also, once we get those first couple cold spells, that normally triggers leaf drop. If the plant is already pushing leaves off of its branches, we do not want to make an application. It's actually going to be a complete waste of your money. Um, the plant will actively be pushing the herbicide out through the leaves, so we would not recommend you, you make that application. I will have folks that really want to make a foliar application, really want to go out there, and I'm telling you, just save your time for next year if that's, that's the way you want to go. So during the application, first and foremost, read your PPE on the label, know first aid, also know what you're calibrated at, know what kind of equipment you have before you even are getting ready to go out. Or if you're working with a um, contractor or working with someone else who's going to you know, hire out and do this, um, just have your T's crossed and your I's dotted before the day of. Um, some recommendations for foliar, as Gloria mentioned, Garlon 4 is really going to be a staple in our recommendations here. 
Um, if you are going to be dealing in rangeland or grazed areas, your max use rate for Garlon 4 is two quarts. So in rangeland, if you want to make a foliar application, two quarts of Garlon 4, and if you want to add two quarts of 22K for increased efficacy, you can. Um, this treatment is best for very small plants. Also because of a foliar application, you want to get the crown of the plant. Anytime if you're going to have to spray up or can't get to the top of that plant, this is not going to be a real great option for you. Um, but a foliar application can work extremely well as a follow-up treatment tool to a cut stump application. Now, when I say cut stump, I'm not talking about mastication. I'm talking about a true cut stump. My number one recommendation is a 3% Garlon 4 plus 1% Amazapir in oil mix. Now keep in mind, this is where knowing your density is really important because if you're dealing in rangeland, two quarts can go really quickly. So just know if you are intending to graze that area, that's your limitations. If it's not a grazing situation, you can actually use up to four quarts of Garlon 4 per acre. Um, another recommendation, uh, Amazapir is not a product that's in my portfolio, but if you do get a little he heavy handed, you can expect some understory damage and Garlon 4 by itself can do it, but it won't happen as often without the Amazapir. For that reason, if you have some desirable vegetation you're concerned with, the 20% Garlon 4 in basil oil may be a um, a recommendation for you. But again, know, know those limitations with your stand density if you're in a grazed area versus non-grazed. Just show of hands in the room, I'm curious how many of you all have worked with or know about Spike, either 20P or 80DF? Okay, I'm getting a kind of. So uh, just to give you a little uh, information about the active, Tebiathyrin has been around for, for several years. This product has two formulations, both a pellet and a dry flowable. The pellet is 20% active, hence the 20P, and that actually comes out, I mean, it, like a kitty litter or a, a pellet form, whereas Spike 80DF is going to be a liquid by the time that you broadcast it. Um, so just wanna make that clarification. The thing to remember about Spike both 20P and ADDF is that this active is not going to be as selective to your desirable woody species. Spike 20P is actually used a lot in my territory for sagebrush thinning. So just know that if this is a route that you do plan to take, your other woody species are probably going to be impacted. However, um, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of when we can make these applications. Spike 20P can be used in both range and pasture and non-crop, either as an individual plant treatment by actually taking the pellets and tossing them on the plant or broadcast, and this would be done by a helicopter most of the time. Um, your rate is going to be between five to 10 pounds per acre and true with, true with Tebuthyron, average rainfall, organic matter, and your elevation will both impact your rates with this product. Straight off the label, if you're doing an IPT or an individual plant treatment with 20P, three eighths of an ounce per 100 square foot. Um, if you get over 20 inches of rainfall, you can bump that up to three quarters of an ounce per 100 square foot. Um, some notes from my field scientist, and again, he reminded me this morning, you have a high possibility for control, but it's more likely a probability of suppression. Um, so just want to manage your expectations there that it can be a little bit easier product to work with, but um, you're looking at more suppression. ADDF only has a non-crop label, which means if you use this product, you are not allowed to graze. Um, the rate is a minimum five pounds per acre, um, minimum of five, uh, five gallons per acre of water. So spike ADDF does have grazing allowances for other applications, but unfortunately with Gamble Oak, it does not. If this is something that we need to look into or something that you feel like we may need to pursue, 
Um, my contact info will be at the end of the presentation or please snag me if someone in this room would like to discuss further. Okay, so after we have made our application, be patient and wait. Uh, it's one of the most difficult things to do, I know, with any herbicide application, but depending on how thick your density is and your route of action here, it can take a while for it to really show symptoms. Um, so next year, a year from application is really when we need to look and evaluate how you want to move forward, um, what your road plan may be. Uh, one option that we didn't really discuss much in the herbicide category, but what I consider to be more of a choice post application would be mastication. Um, the majority of times I get a call for mastication to come first and then to someone come through and try and find the stumps and to treat. It's not a bad course of action, however, what mastication does is it really shatters that cambium layer and that cambium layer is where we are relying that plant to really take in that herbicide. In addition, after mastication, it can be very difficult to find all of those stumps. So if you can't find the stump and can't treat it, um, it's going to be there next year. And because they're all connected, you can't always blame the herbicide or, or blame the tool that you used it's the nature of the beast to come back after you've attacked it in some way if you haven't gotten all of those bases covered. So what I like to re recommend, if, if you can wait to do a mastication, go ahead with your foliar treatment first, or let's talk about how thick this stand is and if we could possibly do a dormant stem and then come in and masticate the, the dead trees after. Um, if clearing is something that you want to incorporate in your plan. So just kind of something to think about there too. So with that, thank you all very much for allowing me to speak with you all about this. Uh, I just want to again say that this is one tool in the toolbox. And I think to really be successful with Gamble Oak, it's really analyzing all of the options you have out there and also knowing where you want to go at the end. What does this piece of land need to be utilized for? And what else, in addition to a herbicide application, is going to be part in that process? So who has the first question or comment I can address? We don't have any um, online um, that I can see so far for you. Um, so if there's anybody in person that might have a question, um, please chime in. Otherwise, we will move on to Marin. Um, I have a couple questions that I've heard from around the region. What kinds of um, effects have you heard about uh, treating garlon and pinyon juniper uh, habitat environments? So I understand that there's, there could be some potential side effects with pinyon juniper. And, uh, is there any way to mitigate that with effects? I don't have experience with pinion juniper. I need to look at the label there, but know that Garlon 4 is a woody plant species material. I mean, it's recommended for control of trees. So if you do have desirable trees, we need to talk about how much they could be affected by and if we can alter rate or application type to mitigate some of that risk. But I would imagine that most species could show some symptomology um, but that one in particular i'm not familiar with i'm sorry that's okay and what are some of your recommendations or comments about using this near uh, water sources and stream sites garlon 3a and vastlan are two other formulations of triclopyr one is an a garlon 3a is an amine and vastlan is a choline a four pound choline formulation Vastland does have a full aquatic label. Garlon 3A does have a full aquatic label. Um, both also have uh, grazing allowances. So if you are making a foliar application, um, those you would have the ability to, to get into the water. Garlon 4 does not. Um, just know that Vastland uh, may not be as efficacious as Garlon 4 in that foliar treatment, but you'd still be able to make that application. Good. 
Claire, somebody had a question real quick before you um, leave. Are there any approximate costs per acre for your herbicide treatment options? I know you talked about a lot of them, but. Uh, okay, so that is a challenging one to answer. First of all, um, know how big the density is that you're treating because this is really going to be all dependent on rate um, rather than actual product cost. Um, I can tell you to think about do you want to go back or how soon do you want to have to go back? Um, but to answer that question, we would need to know who you're purchasing from, what that purchase price is, and then we could break down per acre um, what that cost is. So. Great. I'm going to have Gloria maybe um, stop sharing and um, bring Marin up, but I have one more question for you. Um, yes. So maybe you do want to step aside and then Gloria can hop in there. Um, do you have any, exp oh, what's your experience with Roundup or Sucker Stopper? Mm, yes. So um, I have had some folks do the same mix that I discussed earlier, the 3% Garlon and 1% Amazapir. I have had some do like a 3% Amazapir, 1% uh, um, Roundup or Glyphosate. Uh, pretty hot mix. I mean, it's it's going to be pretty spicy and you're probably going to have some understory effects. But uh, glyphosate is actually not a bad not a bad thing to add into the tank. Um, I don't know about it by itself necessarily unless you've got really small small trees. But yes, that would also be a tool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. <clears throat> Thank you. And next up, we have Marin Chambers. She's a research associate with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. She also gave our webinar, I think, back in August. And so good to see you again, Marin. And um, Gloria's going to pull up her talk. And just a reminder that if you have questions, um, please put them in the Q&A window at the bottom. Um, after Marin will be Seth, and then we will have a good half hour to address uh, the questions and answer. So. Um, Right, Looks like Claire's talk might still be up. Hold on, hold on. We're managing here. No worries. And then, okay. and then you're going to go to slideshow. Yep, start slideshow. And then, yep, you're good to go. All right, are you ready? Yeah, it looks like you should have your notes. Mm -hmm, but that's... All right, let me... So the reason that her notes don't show up is because the screens we're sharing are the screens that are in the win in your room there and then this computer screen that you have. So it's best if the notes... Yeah, go ahead and push that and then we'll see what, what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> that looks best for us. Oh, well. That's fine. <laughs> we, we had it up earlier today. Sorry, Marin. No worries, I'll make it work. All right, so you're All right, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so as Megan said, my name is Marin Chambers. I'm a research associate at the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute here at Colorado State University. Um, and I have the pleasure of talking with you all about a small research project that I've been part of for the last couple of years where we're examining um, the gamble oak and understory species response to mowing treatments on the Uncompagre Plateau. And this is part of the Uncompagre Plateau Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And really the way that this um, small research project started was um, conversations with a wildlife biologist, Eric Friels, who is um, on the uh, Gunnison Uncompagre Grand Mesa um, National Forest Complex. He's part of the Uncompagre Plateau Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And during our discussions, you know, we've kind of talked about this throughout the day already, but um, gamble oak is an interesting um, species with some, some complementary but conflicting um, management implications in that um, gamble oak is an important um, species for wildlife habitat and also for forage. Um, but gamble oak is also an important ladder fuel. Um, and so uh, in discussions with Eric, um, he was really curious to understand how the mowing that they're doing in pine oak ecosystems on the Uncompagre Plateau 
may or may not impact the quality of browse potential. Um, and so we, we started a small project using some funds from the monitoring program of the um, Uncompagre Plateau's Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And we really aim to address um, the following questions. So first, how does understory vegetation respond to mechanical or prescribed burning treatments of gamble oak? Um, what is the growth response in terms of density, but also height of gamble oak following treatments? And then what influence does gamble oak treatments have on other tree regeneration? And so this is um, the, the results I'm going to present to you are just our um, preliminary results one year post treatment. Um, this is part of a longer term um, monitoring project. So hopefully there will be a lot more to come with this. Um, but this project took place on the Uncompagre Plateau, which is a large land mass on the western slope of Colorado. Um, for those of you who can see me here, um, the plateau is right here in Colorado. That's just east of the Colorado-Utah border, um, just south of the city of Grand Junction and just north of the San Juan um, mountain range here in, Col in the western slope of Colorado. Um, and so the, this treatment area took place in a pine oak ecosystem. Um, and we established paired plots where we had one plot in the pair that was going to be um, slated to be cut and the other pot, what plot um, was, would be, remain to be uncut. And so that would act as a control plot. And so all of these plots were um, randomly located using random points that we developed in a um, geographical information um, system program. And so once we navigated to this random point in the field, we found the nearest gamble oak patch um, and then we, within about 50 meters, would identify another gamble oak patch that was similar in size and shape, in species composition, um, slope aspect, and then also canopy cover. So in some cases, there might be a very large um, overstory ponderosa pine tree. And um, if we found that in one of our um, paired, patch paired patches, we um, tried to identify another paired patch that had a similar kind of canopy cover. So we ended up having a total of 15 paired plots um, for a total of 30 plots. And without getting too much into the nitty gritty here, I just want to give you a, a sense of what our plot looks like within these patches. Um, so these plots would be located within the middle of these gamble oak patches. Um, and the plot was a three meter um, circular radius plot. And within the plot, we measured um, all tree species, um, their diameter at breast height or diameter at root collar their estimated height, um, their crown-based height of any tree species. And so um, we found particularly gamble oak, but also aspen in these patches. And then we measured um, the species and height of all seedlings and saplings using size classes. And then within the plot, um, we had uh, quadrats that we laid along tapes that were oriented along the cardinal directions. And these um, quadrats were one meter squared. And then we did a full botanical survey to understand um, what the impacts of gamble oak treatments were having on understory species and then of course browse potential. Um, so in 2016, a few years ago, um, we treated, we, we went and actually um, scouted this uh, treatment area that was called the LaFaire treatment area we established these 30 plots and then we collected pretreatment data. And then in the fall of 2016, mowing occurred. And in 2017, we returned to relocate these plots. And because these plots were, these patches of gamble oak were completely mowed down, we had um, uh, permanently esta established a monument in the middle of the plot um, with a PVC pipe that we hammered essentially into the ground. And then we put um, nuts and bolts into it. So, and then we relocated the plot um, using a, um, uh, what's the word for that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so then we went back and then collected post-treatment data. And so this is just an image of what um, this pre and post-treatment um, patch might have looked like. like. So at the top um, photo we've got a gamble oak patch um, that we had randomly selected to be cut. And then in post-treatment, you can see that that um, patch has been completely mowed down um, and there's a happy cow in the background. 
And then this is just an example of what one of those quadrats might have looked like. Um, so pretreatment, you can see some shade and some dappling of sun coming through, and that really is um, representative of the canopy cover um, from the gamble oak um, that existed prior to mowing. And then following mowing, um, that forest floor had full sun exposure. And so for our first question, um, again, this is just our preliminary data. Um, this is one year post treatment. Um, so we wanted to understand how understory vegetation was responding to treatments of gamble oak. And in this case, it's um, only mowing. And so when we examined um, the understory cover for different functional groups, we found that generally understory cover um, declined following mowing one year post treatment. And this was expected. Um, and generally, I think that there's a fair amount of research that suggests that within treatment areas, not explicit to gamble oak mowing treatments, but um, within treatment areas, the understory vegetation tends to rebound within about two to five years. And always whenever um, we're examining um, any kind of treatment within forested systems, we're always concerned about exotic species. And so overall, we found a, um, a general decline in exotic species one year um, following treatment. Um, but when we dug down into this a little bit more, we found that the three exotic species that we had in, these, um, in this study area was Kentucky bluegrass, Tracy's bluegrass, and dandelion. And so we found an overall mean percent cover decrease in Kentucky bluegrass and Tracy's bluegrass and a very slight um, increase in mean percent cover of common dandelion. Um, we were also interested in understanding um, the impact of these mowing treatments on total understory richness. And so we found that um, total understory richness declined just slightly in our control plot. And this is really probably likely due to either an annual or biennial species that was not present in our post-treatment data collection, or this is a result of human error where we just didn't catch a species or two. Um, but in our mode plots, um, so pre-treatment and post-treatment, we found an increase in um, understory's richness um, just slightly following treatment. And so when we looked at understory richness um, across these different functional groups, we found that shrub species um, tended to remain constant, um, but that exotic and graminoid species declined just slightly, um, whereas forb species um, declined, increased just slightly. And when we examined um, species richness and evenness using Shannon's and Simpson's diversity indices, we found that really across unmode and mode plots pre and post treatment, um, these, these indexes were relatively constant, which really indicates that the treatment did not necessarily um, decrease diversity in, these, um, in the study area at least one year post treatment. We're also really concerned with um, the cover of mountain shrub species. Um, and overall, we found five um, shrub species in this study area. So serviceberry, barberry, gamble oak, which in this study is both um, looked at as a shrub, but also a tree because here, in, um, at least on the Uncompahgre Plateau and in the northern distribution of gamble oak, um, gamble oak can grow as both a low statured shrub, but also a tree, but not quite as large as many of the trees um, gamble oak trees that can grow in the southern distribution of, Gam of gamble oak. Um, we also found woods rose and snowberry. And so we found an overall decline um, in all of these shrub species in the cover. Um, however, again, it's likely that most of these will rebound um, over the next couple of years. And so while we found an overall decrease of gamble oak cover, um, we saw a lot of gamble oak regeneration. So this is just an example of what this looked like. Um, and when we were curious about the growth response in terms of density um, of gamble oak regeneration, um, we found that in our control plots, there was a very slight increase in gamble oak regeneration, which makes sense. Um, and then in our mode plots, um, we saw a nearly 300% increase in gamble oak um, densities, and that's in, in terms of stems per acre. So this is just, again, an example of what this kind of dense um, uh, gamble oak regeneration looked like, um, and kind of a common example of the densities that we were seeing. 
And then um, we also were interested in, in how quickly gamble oak was growing back following treatments. And so um, we found that one year post-treatment, gamble oak regeneration was really dominated by sprouts that were um, between six and 24 inches tall. And so um, that you know, really indicates that within one year, gamble oak can um, reach heights of you know, one to two feet tall um, pretty quickly. But we also found a fair amount of regeneration that was um, less than six inches tall. And so this is just an example of that. We saw a lot of this occurring, not necessarily at the site of um, an older um, uh, masticated gamble oak, um, but kind of you know, next to those um, uh, stumps, but also away from those stumps. And so this is just another example of what one of those um, quadrats would have looked like following treatment. And without um, being able to use a pointer, um, there's a fair amount of gamble oak regeneration on the left and right center of this photo, but then also a lot of individual gamble oak sprouts um, within this one meter squared quadrat. And then we're also interested in understanding how gamble oak mowing treatments um, may influence other tree regeneration. And so we really found again that regeneration was dominated by gamble oak, um, followed by a little bit of aspen. And um, Ponderosa and on the Uncompagre Plateau, I think that maybe Dan um, had referred to this previously, but um, Ponderosa pine is the, the focal species of concern on the Uncompagre Plateau. There's a lot of interest in retaining that species and also encouraging um, a correct amount of um, tree regeneration of, of ponderosa pine um, over the long term. And so we saw very low densities of ponderosa pine seedlings prior to treatment, um, but following treatment, we didn't find any ponderosa pine and that's likely because um, all of those seedlings experienced mortality during mowing. And so here's just another example of, um, this is a full picture of one of our plots. Um, the middle of the photo is our plot center and um, you can see a fair amount of um, gamble oak resprouting. Um, I also wanted to point out that we found a fair amount of uh, browsing of mountain shrubs in our study area. So this is just an image of snowberry. Um, and we particularly saw a lot of browsing on gamble oak. And so we found um, browsing in more than 40% of our plots. Um, this area is is heavily grazed, um, so it's likely that it was both cattle, um, deer, as well as elk. And so in 2018, um, we did not return to do a second year post-treatment um, data collection due to funding constraints. But in 2019, we are re, um, returning to remeasure these plots um, for three years following treatment. And this will be particularly important because prescribed burning is actually planned to happen in this treatment area. And so that would be very important if prescribed burning does occur to assess understory species, mountain shrubs and tree regeneration response to these dual treatments. Um, and this is just some photos that I took on the Uncompagre Plateau a couple of years ago um, in a wildfire that had occurred in Gamble Oak um, ecosystem. And so we expect to see something similar to this. Um, but it would be very curious. And I also want to point out that in 2018, we actually expanded this study to um, a sage oak ecosystem on the Uncompagre Plateau. And the, the purpose of these treatments is really to expand the um, greater sage grass habitat in these areas. And so um, our pine oak um, study area is in the blue, yellow, and green treatment areas on the left. And then the, um, the polygons on the right in orange and in red are um, some of the areas that are be going to be treated with gamble oak and um, sage. And so in 2018, um, my colleague Seth X and some of his graduate students went out and established plots in this um, gamble oak um, uh, sage ecosystem. Um, and established, I believe, 30 plots and will return in 2019 to collect post-treatment data in this ecosystem type using the same um, study design. So with that, if you all have any questions, um, my email address is here at the bottom, Marin Chambers at callestate.edu. There's a lot of people to thank for this. Um, 
And then funding, of course, was provided by the Uncompagre Plateau Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program. And so if there's any, if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to answer any now. Um, hey, Marion, so I think we might just move right on to Seth and then we'll um, save perfect. them for the end. Um, but um, yeah, they're really, I think that's probably the smartest thing to do. Um, so I'm gonna have Gloria stop sharing the screen. And then bring up Seth's talk. Okay. Yeah. Squeeze that. You are. Let me just uh, let's see. Let me just toggle through real quick since I'm not noticing notes. Remind myself if there's anything in particular that I want to make sure I say. Wait, hold on just a second, folks. And just a reminder that um, we'll have about 20 minutes at the end after Seth's talk to um, actually 30 minutes um, to go through and address any questions. So if you've been saving them up, go ahead and put them in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And um, Gloria and I will do our best to sort of run through them at the end and make sure everybody um, gets their questions answered. So right now we have Seth X. He's an assistant professor at the at Colorado State University. Um, and as soon as he gets talk gets pulled up, he will go ahead and get started. Do I click to move forward? Looks good. Come on. All righty, there you go, Dr. X. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can just use the arrows. Yep, try arrows. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm Seth X. I'm a silviculture professor here at CSU. And so I'm just going to outline some ongoing research in Gamble Oak. This is a pretty early stages on this project, so we don't have a lot of results to share, but I'll uh, just let you know where we're, where we're heading with this. Uh, the co-author here is Arian Brazenwood. For those of you who are in the room, uh, it's Arian right here. Uh, he's a, a new master's student. This is going to be his, 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 or his uh, thesis research. Okay, um, so uh, uh, this is pretty closely related to some of the stuff that Marin was talking about. In some ways, there's some overlap here. So uh, this study leverages uh, Marin's efforts as well. Uh, but it, it's a, there's a broader context here for us. Uh, so this is really designed to be a basic science project on Gamble Oak. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the species and, and, uh, and its management for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is, is because it, it's, there's just a lot of it in Colorado. Uh, so in casual conversations with colleagues at uh, Forest Inventory and Analysis, uh, I, I gather it's on the order of two and a half million acres in Colorado. So it's a pretty big, pretty big uh, land cover component here. So it's, it's fairly important just because of its prevalence. Um, it's also really interesting to me because uh, at least for the north part of its distribution up here in Colorado and Utah, uh, there really isn't a whole lot of silvicultural guidance for it. So, uh, you know, if you, you know, people come to me and ask me, uh, you know, what do you think about oak? What should we do about oak? Or what do you think about what we're doing for oak? Do you think it's going to work? Uh, you know, based on, based on the literature, there, I don't really have a whole lot to say. I mean, because pretty much everything we know about it is from uh, it's, uh, the southern extent of its population, where it's a component of pine ecosystems. So it's pretty exciting to have a species like that that there isn't a whole lot known about. And it's, it's kind of interesting to just uh, address that. It doesn't even appear in the Silvix manual for hardwoods in the U U.S. So there's, so most of you probably don't know, but there are these great big awesome tomes that are all the tree species in the United States, Silvix in North America, there's one for hardwoods, there's one for conifers. Oh, gamble oak is completely absent from the one for hardwoods. So there's just really no no fundamental civil guidance, or very little fundamental civil cultural guidance for it. Um, also, uh, it's, it's got this awesome morphological plasticity, which Marin alluded to, which is that it can occur as a shrub or a tree, and it can do that in fairly close proximity. So you can see these, you can actually sometimes see trees and shrubs within speeding distance of each other, the same species, and it's just morphologically really different, which is just super interesting uh, to me. It's like, well, there's all, there's all kinds of civil cultural implications for this. So that's what we're looking at here on the slides now. Our uh, tree and shrub form gamble oak. Uh, these, both these pictures are from the Uncompagre Plateau. That's the geographic location for the most part for what we're doing is, is, is on the Uncompagre Plateau in Western Colorado. And we have uh, a grove of gamble oak trees on the left and a, and a patch of uh, gamble oak shrubs on the right. 
Um, generally seems to uh, uh, take tree farms and better sites. Uh, that's, that's the impression I get and other, others get as well. So on, on better, uh, deeper soils, more water availability, that kind of thing seem to see trees. And then the shrubs seem to occur on, on harsher sites, dry, hotter, drier locations for the most part. So we, we have a, a few overarching questions here. So what are we really interested in? I, I can box these things into two, two general categories, right? So, um, man, I'm really interested in the, the typical age structures of gamble oak trees and shrub patches of trees and shrubs. And so that's in tree demography, really, or shrub demography. What's going on in those things? Are they, are they, are they the same? Are they uh, performing the same way in terms of how those, those populations are developing over time? Are, are these... Uh, even aged, even aged clumps where everything's establishing pretty quickly, and then there's you know, everything's pretty much the same age. Are they uneven aged? Is that the same and for for clumps of shrubs versus clumps of trees? Uh, is there some sort of really interesting story to be told there about how they're developing differently? Uh, don't really know. Um, there isn't a, isn't a ton of, of research on that. And then uh, this 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 morphological plasticity. You know, as a silviculture is looking at looking at stands of of trees, which is what I normally look at stands of trees. I think little trees bad sites. They're just not that productive. And and so I mean that's my instinct for the oak. I go well, shrubs bad sites. They're just not that good. Uh, but I, I don't really know that, and and I don't think there is a really definitive answer to that. So you know what's what's how, how tight is the relationship uh, between site quality and, uh, and morphology of these plants? Because there are other things that could be going on there, right? So there could be some genetic controls on growth form. Uh, there could be uh, just age differences, right? I mean, shrubs could just be younger than the trees. Um, and and uh, there could be some crowding issues as well. So the, the overall structure of the project, this is hatch funding. So this is an agricultural experiment station project through the, uh, through the Colorado State University. Uh, so we have about three years to make some progress on some basic science questions here. And then as I alluded to, it leverages the, the Uncompagre Seafler project. Um, we're, we're aligning our efforts with monitoring of mastication treatments on the Uncompagre Plateau. Uh, there's some benefits in just establishing a strong link to management there. And uh, as well as, as, as you'll see, unless I talk too much and run out of time, um, we've found an opportunity to do a little bit of a, a pilot thinning project by, by leveraging that. Um, leveraging that monitoring effort. So there's a couple benefits there. So let's take these uh, take, see, take these pieces one, one at a time. We'll talk about age structure first, and then talk about um, morphological plasticity and, and what we want to know and how that's why that's interesting to me as a silviculturist. Um, so uh, when it comes to the age structure of these patches, I mean the the, the big issue, the big question to me is are, are these things reproducing in place? Are they able to perpetuate themselves over time and, and assume what we would call an uneven age structure in, in, in silviculture or forest ecology? Or are they really fundamentally even aged in that you know, there's, a, there's some sort of a period of regeneration which stops eventually and then the trees just get older over time? And, and is that the same for trees and shrubs? So there are some considerations that, that you, can, you, you can deal with before you even go out and collect data that would inform this. Um, the sprouting habit of gamble oak that we've heard a lot about today implies that they would be more even aged than uneven aged. I mean, they, they just sprout aggressively following disturbance, uh, implies they probably occupy the growing space fairly readily. We expect these things to look pretty even aged on the whole out there. Um, alternatively, uh, in places where they can reproduce sexually from seeds, uh, we, we may see more uneven aged structures because uh, trees show up. Uh, periodically over time and uh, establish more of an uneven age distribution. Uh, and then stand dynamics could play a role here as well. So we might have stands that start out looking really even aged and then as they grow older and you know, things happen, uh, uh, bad things happen to good trees as a former mentor of mine likes to say. Um, you know, so trees die, right? And, and you get some sort of gap dynamics type process uh, emerges and you might see more uneven age structure develop over time. So any of this stuff could be going on. Um, why does it matter? I mean, why do we care? This is like, you know, basic ecology stuff, right? I mean, uh, I'm a management guy. Why do I care about basic ecology? Uh, fundamentally, you know, I think good silvicultural prescriptions come from a, a good understanding of how the system works. And I just, I just don't feel like that's there for Gamble Oak, uh, at least not in the northern part of its range. I mean, I just feel like there's some fundamental questions that we don't, we don't have clarity on. Um, so what are, what does stand development trajectories look like in the absence of management following natural disturbance? because we can really profitably capitalize on that to design prescriptions that are effective, that, that sort of emulate those. 
um, those natural trajectories. So this would be ecological analogs for management. We do this with aspen. Uh, we do this with uh, lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine, all the all the all the the big mostly conifer tree species that we manage in the West. We have a pretty good understanding of the natural uh, uh, natural function of those species in in in, uh, in the absence of management, and we capitalize on that to manage them in um, in harmony with that. Sometimes when we're doing it, when we're doing a good job. So uh, this is a, this is a zoomed in uh, image of one of those slides that Marin showed a few minutes ago. This is the uh, the the Sage Park Enhancement Project that was was put in place this year in, in, in 2018. Um, this is where we did our pilot sampling uh, just this last year. So in 2018, we did some pilot sampling for this basic science project, and we took advantage of uh, this monitoring project to kind of you know overlay our sampling over top of that footprint so we're looking at this this kind of uh oh i don't know like upside down j-shaped polygon is a couple hundred acres maybe as many as 300 acres of uh, sage park enhancement the area in the middle of the frame is a sage park the idea was to push back the boundaries of that by masticating gamble oak uh, we dropped a bunch of uh, plots in there uh, we only sampled um, in 15 of these locations, so we had a lot of extra plots. So we didn't get to all of these locations, but we sampled in 15 of the 15 of these locations. And in each of those locations, we used uh, Marin's paired treatment control design to identify clumps that were going to be masticated, clumps that were going to be controls, and then we also did some uh, some thinning, which we may talk about at the end. A um, couple key people to call out here: uh, Ed Hill is a student at CSU. He was the one; he was instrumental in uh, adapting the the protocol that Marin designed to the protocol that we were putting in place for our, bio, our, our, our destructive sampling for to understand productivity. And he actually went down and did all the work, so uh, he should be called out. Uh, as well as Eric Friels uh, on the on the the GMUG was our a very good partner for us on that side, really facilitated making all this happen. So what did we get by sampling in here this summer? Um, we actually didn't collect a ton of data, but we got we learned a lot about our protocols. Uh, so we we sampled in in um, within the within the the monitoring project. We sampled across five clumps that ranged in average tree size from really little shrubs, you know, so maybe a meter tall, up to the biggest trees we could find, gamble oak trees in this area that were about four meters plus. Um, and then within each of those clumps, we sampled across the range of tree sizes in each clump, and we destructively we destructively sampled biomass. And, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, what do we get about the age, what do we get uh, what do we learn about age structure from this very preliminary sampling? Um, some really kind of interesting stuff. So uh, we're looking at just a simple scatter plot of diameter and age for the the trees in the five different clumps of oak that we sampled. So the, the different uh, symbols are different clumps. And uh, a couple of things just jump right out at me from here. And one of those is that the, there's a really, really tight relationship between diameter and age up to about 100 years. Uh, implies a couple things to me. Uh, implies that um, there's probably not a lot of competition going on up to 100 years or so because there isn't a lot of size differentiation of stems. So, uh, so we're, we're not seeing that. Um, and, and it implies that um, uh, damn, I can't see my notes. There was something else I was going to say about that. Maybe I'll come back to it. You uh, to nah, it's all right. If it was important I'd remember it, right? <laughs> um, so, so there's, there, there it, it indicates there's, there's likely, uh, likely not a lot of competition going on early in stand development, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, and, and we're seeing some, some, some spread in age prior to 100 years. So if you look at the, the, the y-axis, within a clump, there's, pretty, there's, there's some, some differentiation in age. I mean, there, we're seeing uh, individuals at different ages within the same clump. And that went away for the two oldest clumps we looked at. When you get out to these oldest two clumps, the, the uh, orange squares and the x's up there, those are our oldest two clumps, the biggest trees not a lot of age uh, difference in there. Really kind of interesting. So we're not seeing more uneven age structure developing over time as a result of stand dynamics. We're seeing less uneven age structure. And so what's going on there, we don't really know. Uh, but a couple ideas would be that as these things are getting older, a competition starts to develop in those clumps. And maybe the, the oldest individuals, the ones that were farthest ahead when competition started to happen that were biggest already are the only ones that can pull through that. 
And so they just become even aged eventually because the, 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 the laggards fall out over time. Uh, could be that, that we've captured some difference in regeneration uh, dynamics between these specific clumps. And so these older couple of clumps uh, regenerated quickly for some reason and the newer ones are taking longer to regenerate. Don't really know, but uh, really exciting uh, to see that because it's not what I expected to see and it makes me want to collect a lot more age data, which we're going to do that next year. Um, Let's talk about morphology and productivity for a minute. A um, couple ideas that I, I think I already articulated a minute ago, but just to, to make it really clear, uh, a couple things that could be happening here that seem to be likely to me are that um, these shrub, shrub form oak could be younger than our tree form oak. Uh, alternatively, or, or maybe in addition, that they could occur on less productive sites. Uh, and then again, there's other things that could be going on as well, particularly um, there could be some genetic variation out there that's causing trees to be are causing these things to be shrubs versus trees. Uh, again, why do we care silviculturally? Well, this really, it gives us a sense of the, our, our operating space in terms of silviculture. What can we realistically expect to accomplish? Uh, are, there, are there conditions out there where we have shrub fields where we could go in and do things silviculturally and, and make trees or, or make bigger shrubs anyway? Uh, or is that you know, hopeless? And, and, and you know, it may be that both conditions exist on the landscape. Um, and then there's just, there's practical reasons to understand the productivity of trees, trees versus shrubs. I mean, we, we care about forage production. Uh, we care about uh, the rate of fields production across the landscape. So it's, there's just some practical reasons to get into this. Uh, our approach for, for dealing with this involves developing biomass allometries. That's a big fancy word. It just means it's a relationship between plant parts. In this case, we're interested in the relationship between diameter and height and biomass. Um, and biomass of, of specific components for us, uh, like, like foliage or, or, or woody, woody material. Um, allometries are, are, are really kind of an interesting thing once you start dealing with them because there's some sort of perennial issues with them. Uh, there's uncertainties with regarding how well they transport across geographic areas, say example, uh, for example, between the Front Range versus Western Colorado or between uh, sites of different quality within, within a specific geographic area. And again, there's some practical application for developing allometries, just it's, it's helpful to have them to characterize forage and fuels production or, or standing stocks of these sorts of things. How do we develop allometries? We do it through destructive sampling. So uh, that's what these folks are doing in these pictures. On the left, we have a couple of technicians that cut down this tree and they're dividing it up into different size classes of material using clippers. Uh, there's a blue tarp behind these guys that they're, they're piling foliage on. So they're gonna pile all this foliage on this tarp and they're gonna weigh it. That's the tripod on the right. It's got a scale hanging on it. So we're gonna weigh that and get a, a total mass of the entire tree by all these different components. And then we subsample that, bring subsamples back here, and dry them and develop ratio estimators. And then we can we can back calculate the biomass of the tree. So that's that's how we develop our ratio estimators and build these, build these allometries. Um, we have some pilot data from last summer that we've looked at and it's, it's pretty promising for a couple of reasons. One is it's a pretty tight relationship like our, like our age data. Uh, this looks really good. I've looked at a bunch of allometries in my career so far and this one looks as good as any I've seen. Uh, that that is, it implies that we're probably going to be able to get pretty, uh, a pretty good sense of what biomass looks like across the landscape using these methods. Um, this is for total tree biomass. It's not broken out into components yet, so we have to look at what that looks like. But uh, for total tree biomass, things look pretty good. Um, interestingly, when we plot our data, which is the orange, here you can't see the, the legend is cut off. Uh, you, our data are the orange dots. We drop that over top of the red dots, which is uh, destructively sampled data from the front range that was collected four years ago in 2014. Uh, they, they line up really, really well. Implies that, that maybe these allometric relationships are fairly stable, at least geographically. So um, also, also um, promising. Okay, I have one minute, so I'll run through this just to put a plug in for, I, I, I love this. Uh, it, um, leverage projects that, that uh, have some direct connection to management. So we were able to uh, take this paired treatment control study that Marin put together and add a second treatment. Uh, so instead of just mastication and control, uh, we, we experimented with some thinning. Uh, we thinned these gamble oak patches uh, across our ranges of sizes. Um, and with the, the proximate goal of understanding the effect of leaving some retention trees on sprouting, maybe, maybe there'd be some pressure, some suppression there of the sprouting response. Maybe it'd be some facilitation of the sprouting response. We don't know. Um, we're sort of excited to see what happens with that. It could lead to a pilot or a, it could be a pilot for a bigger thinning study down the road if we see something interesting in the next couple of years. So just another benefit of leveraging, um, leveraging monitoring projects.
we'll do more sampling in 2019. Uh, we'll add a whole heck of a lot of age data and, and try to find efficiencies in our biomass sampling. So we're not doing as much cutting up and weighing of trees and any more than we have to. But uh, the big thing here is we'll, we'll uh, collect a heck of a lot of age data because that's proving to be pretty interesting so far and, and be across uh, multiple sites instead of just in one location like we were this last year. So I'm really excited to see where this goes and uh, I'll be happy to share results with you as we move forward if it's interesting to you and thanks for having me today it's been my pleasure so i think thanks, that's Dad. all i got appreciate it um thank you so much um we have a bunch of questions that are coming in on the um in the pod our q a pod so if all of the speakers could turn their cameras on um that'd be much appreciated and then we can sort of dole these questions out as um, they are appropriate. We still have over 100 people um, tuning in online, so I assume those people have been sort of saving their questions and might have some as well. Um, so, Gloria, I think what I might do is have you stop sharing, um, and then we will have the speaker spaces sort of get blown up a little bit more, and then it'll feel a little more personal. Um, and I just wanted to read a, read a first question, um, or it was more of a comment about the goat wildlife interaction um, that was a um, oh hold on let me fix something um, I've um, invited Marin Kyle, and Seth to kind of come up here closer to the microphone good deal okay Jonathan uh, any, I think uh, on-site questions we can repeat Awesome. And be here to answer. Cool, that sounds great. Um, Keith Worley had a co comment about goat wildlife conflicts. I'm just going to read that so everybody can sort of chime in if they want to. But um, Keith Worley uh, indicates that he's dealt with predator losses to to uh, mountain lions. Um, so I'm not sure where Keith works, but maybe he can let us know in the um, chat window. Um, but it's definitely not a good PR <laughs> thing he says. It happened in Roxboro. Uh, where two goats were killed, and Perry Park, where three goats were killed. Um, bears weren't a problem uh, when the guard dog was present. Um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has concerns for goat use in areas with native bighorn sheep populations um, due to potential disease parasite introduction uh, for natives. So um, Einer mentioned that he hasn't had that problem in his district, which is a good thing, uh, but something certainly to keep in mind. Um, and Wendy said, just chiming in, service berry is not poisonous to goats. Somebody had that question. Um, and okay, I'm gonna sort of start from the top. Um, is there any questions, burning questions on site there, Gloria, or should I just sort of go through them? What do you folks think uh, about goats, about uh, sampling methods, about what we're finding with age distributions? I think that's fascinating really addressing really some real structural questions that nobody's really looked at. I had a question about the age versus the diameter. If you check the height, would you see the same correlation with the height? All right, also? so I'm going to repeat it for our line. So what's your question again? If you have the same correlation with the height as you did for the diameter with the age. So there's a lady here wants to know, is asking Seth if there's the same correlation with height and age in sampling. I talk from here, do I? No, come on, come on up. Then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can we can actually hear. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I don't think we have. I made a couple figures, and the relationship is similar, but it's not as strong. Yeah, that's what I would have thought. So. Yeah. Where the competition is competition. Uh, you know, it's probably for for you know, the trees that we sample browsing is probably an issue with that, and they're so brown. There's a lot of browsing. Hey, Gloria, I was wrong. We can't hear. So maybe everybody could gather around. I know that's sorry, awkward to have everybody yeah, stand I was thinking up, about turning the laptop around, but this. No, I, I, I'd prefer if you guys all just stood there so we could see and hear you. Sorry. That's a, there's a microphone right here. Okay, so with respect to the height and age uh, versus diameter and age relationship, uh, yeah, there is a similar relationship, but it's noisier. And uh, it probably has something to do with browsing uh, where we are, because there's been uh, quite a bit of browsing activity. By elk. <laughs> Probably elk, yeah. And cows, maybe. Yeah. So Keith has another, oh, did something there on tight? Yeah, um, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, Seth, uh, just uh, as long as you're up there, um, that uh, age cap was really interesting because that's 1879's fire. You need to cross take those sections, first of all, to be sure that you got right dates on those. 
But I bet that was 1871 fire. Because uh -huh. that was the last big fire. I've sampled a lot of age structure in oak, and it dates to the last fire. Yeah. Just about mm -hmm. only the last. So, okay. can you repeat that question, please? It's really neat to have that uh, age diameter. So uh, Peter's Peter's comment was that the the, the we, about 130 years or wherever uh, where we were seeing the oldest oak that we, we sampled in that one in that one geographic area he said that there's a historical fire that uh, likely would have would have produced that and so I think he's volunteering to help us do some cross dating. Yeah. <laughs> um, Keith asks, has anyone done any acorn viability testing? The reason he asks is. Um, there's been heavy, almost 100% damage by seed feeding insects, such as weevils. Who wants to take that question on? Anybody? Anybody here? We have extension agents here. We have brilliant people generating <laughs> brain waves. Any, any sampling on uh, uh, acorn seed viability? Uh, no, no takers here. Must be a good um, opportunity for future research. Okay. Sounds and like you get in the master's program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to point out about that was so fascinating about Oak that, that Seth and some of the other speakers alluded to is that there's actually three reproductive methods that, that Gamble Oak has, uh, the acorns obviously, and correct me if I have my biology wrong, but that the root system is made up, the reproductive root system is made up of both rhizomes and lignotubers. So the root system can take advantage of two different shoot, um, sucker and shoot, shoot methods. Um, so you have to, I guess, manage for all of, all of those, um, which makes it even more competitive. I don't know if the other super suckering sprouting mountain shrubs have that structure as well um but oak sure does i'd like i'd like to ask the speakers to pull up their question and answer um, pods on a maybe different screen or sort of in a different window so you all can see the questions as well um, but john asked a question um how long can the allelopath allelopath Help me with that word. Allelopathic. Allelopathic effects of gamble oak be expected to persist after the removal of oak. Um, who wants to chime in on that one? That would be you, sir. How long are the allelopathic effects of gamble oak can be expected to persist after removal? Any ideas? I have no idea. We have no idea here at Colorado State <laughs> University. We're on it. All right, moving on, Keith asks, any studies done regarding combustibility of decadent oak versus re-sprouted oak? Um, the question, his question is based on re-sprouted oak that did not carry fire during the Waldo Canyon fire above Cedar Heights. Has anyone else seen this? Any This is Dan, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I, I think, um, it's not uh, a study, but just uh, anecdotal from uh, experience on fire. Um, I think there's there's a period after treatment or burning of oak where it is not as combustible. Um, how long that is, I think, is very site dependent and probably moisture dependent. Um, I would guess it's somewhere like eight to 10, maybe up to 15 years. And then I think you start getting a litter um, enough litter and duff in the understory, you start supporting surface fire and there's enough canopy and canopy closure, it'll start to carry a fire again. <clears throat> Just the one time I did, you prescribed fire um, in an area that had been just burned previously. Um, three years before we had burned a big block of ground aerially, and then we came in and burned the next block three years later. We had a little leftover fuel with the helicopter, so we took it over um, to that previously burned area and tried to light that again and just consume, uh, build some patchwork into that H class structure. And we couldn't get it to carry at all in three years, three years post initial treatment. But I would say eight to 10, maybe up to 15 years. Um, after that, I think that that fuel treatment value goes away. Uh, we have a question for Einer uh, regarding the goat browsing or actually first, 
Um, really quick, Gloria, I'm going to launch the polls for all of our online attendees to take. Um, so you're going to have to just minimize that when it pops up because it's going to get in the way of your screen. Okay. So just click the minimize button and then it won't interfere with you. So all of our online people, please just take our poll really quick and let us know how we're doing. Um, that really helps us um, continue to improve these webinars. Um, so for Einar, regarding the goat browsing, how does this affect uh, fuel continuity across the landscape or relate to recommended spacing of trees, fuels within standard guidelines? So goat browsing doesn't deal with horizontal continuity except to remove the, uh, the shorter new growth after treatment, so the next year's worth of growth. Uh, dealing with the vertical continuity. So goats are not the only solution for wildfire mitigation in oak communities. Goats are a significant part of the solution though. Does go and we have another anonymous question. You can probably see the same question there. Yeah. Do you want so to does go goat ahead? browsing? So does goat browsing reduce crown fire potential in gamble oak or conifers within the treatment areas? Is this calculated or verified by fire modeling? Uh, I'm hoping that it does. And by removing the ladder fuels up to six feet, it should protect. If the if we have a window of uh, no ladder fuels uh, vertically from the surface up to those canopies. If we're talking about a low to moderate intensity wildfire, those canopies should be protected. Uh, no, we haven't used fire modeling to show that. Uh, I, I don't know, the models, are, the models are based, I'm reminded of George Box, right? The, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, but I, I think it would be a useful thing to look at and see if, six feet up is good enough for the Campbell Oak. Uh, hopefully it is. Uh, but like I say, until we get an unfortunate fire in one of those mitigated areas, we don't really know what it's going to do. And I would argue too, I, I'm not trying to sound defensive, but with the way that wildfires are starting to break rules and break models and break modeling, maybe our models need to change as well. So I don't know. I, I don't mean to offend anybody with that comment, but uh, I, I think that there's a lot of research that needs, a lot of study that needs to be done regarding what those requirements are in our 2018 global warming communities. So throw me some softballs for goodness sakes. <laughs> <laughs> we have an anonymous um, attendee asking the our uh, but stating the mowing of gamble oak seems to be a suitable treatment if it can be repeated regularly over time to weaken and kill off the gamble oak root systems, similar to other hardwoods in other parts of the United States. Is this verified by any research that any of you all know of or field experience that you've had? Anybody can chime in. So if there's people on site there that have experience, by all means, we're interested in hearing from you. Um, but anybody else too? Kind of opens up the potential for that foliage application. I'll say that lowering, you know, if you're working with regrowth, so you can bring trees in a little bit easier to do it more a cheaper application of herbicide on regrowth. So that would be a possibility of incorporating herbicide use into a site that you you were first coming into where the plants would be too big mm -hmm. and too costly to do too much cut stump removal. An application. So, masticate first, come in during regrowth and spray. I don't know if there's also on that, but that would be kind yeah. of a management process. I'm not sure if everybody heard that. So, what, what our attendee is suggesting, what's your name, sir? Mike Hachello. Mike Hachello is, is suggesting that uh, with repeated mowing, you manage to get uh, increased access, easier access for crews to come in later uh, during a substantial regrowth stage and apply foliar uh, herbicide treatments um, for better effectiveness um, after repeated mowing. And a little more cost effective. And a little more cost effective too. So in that way, repeated mowing would make a combined mowing herbicide treatment more effective. Good comment, we apply that. And this is Dan and just my thoughts on this and it was one thing we we talked about kind of in the intro about how do we pile multiple treatments onto an, an oak landscape um, and, and how much more effective are we that way and I think there's all kinds of combinations of those kind of treatments we can do 
one that came up to me is um, post chemical treatment. How many years would we have to wait to bring goats in for the goats to be be safe in that environment to eat the shoots or post mastication bring goats? And Marin's doing some studies now with mastication, and then we hope to put some fire on the ground. But I think that's that maybe the next generation of of research is how can we put multiple treatments in quick succession on those landscapes and try to uh, try to get rid of some of that carbohydrate reserves in the root systems and, and hammer the oak a little bit. Mike, did you have um, a comment? Those products that Claire mentioned do have grazing um, restrictions. Um, or you're allowed to graze with oh. them. So you could go in and do applications with them and graze probably within six months or a year uh, very quickly with the right stuff. So Mike is suggesting uh, if we went back and reviewed, Claire had to leave because she made some time to come up here for her presentation, left a conference in Loveland to come up here and present, so she had to leave. Um, but he's suggesting that two of the products that she discussed were cleared for grazing, so you could follow up some uh, foliar herbicide treatment with grazing treatment for you with those. Um, Alan Gallimore stated, uh, while working with individual landowners in the front range, I had one landowner who would bush hog his defensible space to cut grass and oak sprouts over several years. This had killed their root systems. So one person. Um, what about the wildland firefighters? Yeah. Did you want to? Go ahead. Go ahead and read that one. Oh, uh, wildland firefighters used to use oak stands as safety zones. Hmm. Well, um, will the combustibility of this species continue to worsen or will changes in climate suppress growth in fuel volume? Um, I don't know. I, I think um, I, I may not be the best person to address that. Maybe um, Jonathan Coop would be or Kyle, but I think that the Storm King fire stands in testament to the effects of using hanging out in oak in fire. Jonathan, what do you, what do you, th what do you think? Sure. I, I don't really have any sense of that. I think um, probably the, you know, the best predictor, uh, you know, of whether or not that's still a safe area would just be the something like leaf moisture or something, you know, which could vary depending on time of year, um, whether, you know, there had been any sort of frost event or anything like that that had killed or damaged the leaves prior to the, prior to the summer season. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I really want to speculate too far on that one. Yeah, I can I can touch on that real quickly. Yeah, come on up. Kyle's gonna talk about that real quick. So I'm not sure where the the question came from geographically, but I know that um, there has been a fair bit of research in California looking at oak as a fire break, sort of the influences of of oak in those types of landscapes. Um, and potentially like things like coast live oak might be less flammable than the chaparral plants that they're intermingled with, um, but potentially less, um, less common of an influence here in Colorado and some of these like more shrub form communities. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak a little to that. Usually I think with the, the shrub form gamble oak that we have in Colorado and Utah, it's, uh, I don't think most firefighters are are considering that to be part of their safety zones. There are times of the year um, in certain weather conditions, yeah, it would work. Um, but generally, we're looking for big open grassy areas and not using using oak in the form we have here. So down the road, how that you know the volume and uh, and growth of of oak changes with climate change, who knows? I think it's going to cover more of the landscape. So I think there'll be more of it out there. Um, and I'm guessing it will be more flammable, but uh, will it have more fuel volume or fuel loading um, in a drier climate? I, I can't answer that, but not a good idea to probably use it as a safety zone. Anything else um, on site? It looks like we lost Einer, so. Uh, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> The goats were very popular, and I always love the, the photos of them being so happy. Yes. Eating the oak. Any, anybody else? Any comments? Yes. This might be for, maybe for Jonathan, but he 
question is comparing the race sprouting in the aspen and oak are similar, um, in, like in the regrowth and resprouting. Do they have a similar uh, shade tolerance? So, uh, Jonathan, when you're comparing aspen and oak resprouting, do you think that both the aspen and the oak have the same shade tolerance in the resprouting stage yeah, after after an event? Okay, so if you're trying to encourage after these post-fire, post-treatment areas, and you're trying to encourage more aspen, um, what kind of? Would there be much difference in shade tolerance between oak and ask? Any observations? You know, my sense is that um, they they are quite similar in their capacity to resprout following fire, and I would also speculate they're both. You know, these are both relatively shade intolerant species that are you know happiest sort of resprouting in in um, well lit you know, sunny sites. Um, you know, the, the, the main difference would be sort of, I think, moisture availability and or tolerance to, you know, or competitive ability where you have more mesic or, or more xeric conditions. So, you know, certainly the aspen tend to occur generally at slightly higher elevations. You can, you can get them sort of intermixed, but um, the oak tend to fall out at lower elevations and the aspen at higher elevations. Um, and so that would, you know, imply some sort of uh, moisture availability thing. It's kind of guiding what, what the outcome is. Generally, though, of course, if you have, generally the resprouting, you already have those species present. And so it's more, quite, you know, you, you end up with what you had before. Um, but, it, you know, it could be interesting to go into some of these ecotones where you've got both and, and look at, you know, what conditions might lead to, you know, aspen versus oak, um, you know, um, outcomes. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, a lot of good questions. Hey, since Einar had to leave, I just want to leave, read a question out loud that he answered. Um, he had to go teach third graders about fire safety, he said. So um, and somebody asked a question earlier about goat wildlife interactions, and Einar stated that Goat Green, the company they partner with, surrounds each acre of a treatment area with an electric fence. Um, it's not electrified during the open house event, he says, uh, but they have dogs and wranglers on site 24-7. Um, that's part of the reason why they haven't had any wildlife issues. Um, and then somebody had a question about the cost. Let me just see if I can find it. I think it was... Um Oh, was, green, what did green, goat green charge for mobilization and trucking? Um, did you include this in your $1,000 an acre estimate? So mobilization was two grand for the five neighborhoods combined, and trucking was about 600 per neighborhood that participated. So a little more in-depth on the cost estimate for that. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a, a lot of little tiny chainsaws working there. When we ran our company, we had a, we had a three to four man crew um, thinning an acre of oak. I think, I can't remember the rate, but it would take, it would take three guys uh, with uh, chainsaws and a chipper running to tree the third of an acre um, in a few days. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's, that's applying, you know, that's cut stump treatment with herbicide as well. Keith asks um, our speakers that are remaining here, any experiences with level of conifer thinning to help reduce oak release? Um, his experience is oak releases and you need a plan for oak management in the understory to not make the problem any worse. Yeah, I think what we've seen, um, you know, we want to get open grown ponderosa pine stands, but we have to really take into account how much oak is in the understory because when we do open them up, um, we tend to get a flush of, of oak into those openings. So there's a balance between keeping enough shade in, over the oak brush to keep it in check a little bit and yet trying to achieve your ponderosa pine objectives as well. Nobody else wants to chime in on that. Um, I'll just remind everybody online to please um, take our poll really quick. Um, it's hopefully launched on your screen. Um, Dustin asked another question about the popular goat method. How many acres are covered per day with 300 goats? So um, Einer said that 
300 goats can treat one acre per day. Um, getting at that. Those are, are sweet any, little guys. That's great. <laughs> are there any other questions before we wrap up for this great um, webinar? Any other questions before anybody leave? We all wrap up. No? I, I really thank so many people for, for coming. Uh, we had, uh, I think at our top uh, participation online, we had, uh, what, 125, 130 people. Yep. Plus, plus the people here nationwide. So that it shows that even though it's this ubiquitous, annoying, or sometimes beautiful shrub, that we have a lot of interest in managing it and improving our information exchange. Um, those of you here on site, I apologize. I didn't print out the poll for you to, to fill out, but watch for a, um, a survey monkey coming up that will be getting ideas for where we launch from here. This is a lot of really great information. It's wonderful to know that people are really starting to ask questions and move forward with this, with this issue. Um, and I'm also kind of thinking I'd like to toss out that we might perhaps look at some kind of synthesis of the um, research and topics presented today and so maybe some sort of online or hard copy form to complement the videos that will get posted. Uh, so people have something in hand to, to contemplate and compare and contact the researchers. So I'm just tossing that out as a possibility. Great, Gloria. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, thanks, thank everybody. Uh, just one, one, last, one last thing before everybody takes off is, is as Gloria mentioned, we want to get some kind of survey out to folks about what the next generation of research looks like. So think about what your local questions are, and we'll try to put a good survey together and, uh, and figure that out and try to drive more research over the next few years. That's really applicable to management. It's got to be applicable to management to to help solve these issues with oak. Thanks. All right, real quick, um, before everybody scrams, I uh, would like to uh, thanks to our partners, um, Utah State University Forestry Extension, where Megan works is a huge partner with Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, and we partner on a lot of uh, forest and range management issues. University of Colorado Boulder, Kyle Rodman was really with us the whole way and organized the speakers and really worked hard at pulling a lot of this together. Thank you to Kyle. Uh, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network helps to pull this together. We'll leverage this for other products in the future. CCU Warner College of Natural Resources. Here's our links again for uh, continuing education credits. And the link also for these recordings will be posted. We'll try to timestamp the speakers so you can zap in on what you're interested in. Um, and any questions, please contact one of us. And thank you for- Thanks everybody. Cheers. Good job. Cheers. Have a, have a wonderful you, day. Bye. Bye. Bye.